There was about two years ago in Madrid. It was an OCLC conference. And that's where I uh, first saw Anna. And uh, she was speaking about uh, teenage education, basically extracurriculum education. And that was a very interesting topic for us because the idea was how do you get a message that you would like to, to transmit to an audience that you have nothing in common with it. And the channels that you need to use in order to still get your message to them. It was a very interesting presentation and I thought it would be very useful to have Anna here. Well, in the meantime, she shifted to different topics and um, she is uh, working at the intersection of education, technology, technology and arts. She's self-employed and uh, she's in Yash right now. Anna Maurensberger. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you for the nice introductory words. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm very honored to speak here. It's, uh, Doran and I, when we met in Madrid, it was uh, a hall a little bit like this one. So every time we meet, it seems to be on uh, really in beautiful environments. And it's very fitting because actually what I'm speaking about today is environments. Beautiful, maybe beautiful or not beautiful environments. I'm going to speak about virtual environments, virtual realities. Um, and. I'm super glad to do so because I think there is nothing more, uh, nothing more beautiful than really being able to speak about the things that you are passionate about. And um, this is something that I'm super passionate about right now. There's not so much research in the field yet, but it's slowly starting to evolve and that's why I want to share this with you. Before I start out, I would like to know a little, about, a little bit about you. We have the privilege to be an intimate circle. so. Um, just to know where you come from or from Horizons, uh, who of you works as a teacher? Okay, a few hands, four hands. Who works as a librarian maybe? A lot of librarians, okay. A researcher? Uh -huh. Who of you has already tried out a virtual reality headset? One, two, three, four. Only the men, that is interesting. <laughs> you have? No, you haven't. Okay, so I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about virtual reality in a second. For now, I want to start out with you. So without changing your posture, I invite you to um, feel the way you are sitting here. Don't change your posture, just see how you are sitting here. How is your body presenting himself, itself? It's the only thing. So I already see someone like, getting a little bit back in the chair. Okay, so just see how you're sitting here. Are you maybe hunching a little bit? Do you have your, I can sit too. Do you have your, um, your legs crossed like this maybe? This is a very female way of sitting. Or are you taking a lot of space? Yeah, just realize this. How are you sitting? And now um, maybe just through a small movement, do something to sit a little bit more comfortably in the chair. Do that now. So just, yeah, maybe some of you have crossed legs. Yeah, it's good, you are so few, I can really see uh, all of you. And we're going to see in a moment that body language conveys a lot, yeah? Um, there's another little exercise I want to do with you. Look at me with serious faces. Most of you are already looking with serious faces. And then you go, you smile. Okay, and do that again, very consciously. Look at me with a serious face and then you smile. Maybe you can, you realize that there is something happening. Did you realize that there's something happening? Who, di who realized that there's something happening? Okay, a few hands. So actually, what happens when I do this, when I smile, my whole emotional background smiles, okay? So it's like giving a signal out to my cognition, to my emotional mind, to feel more positive, even if it's just this little movement. And I find this super interesting, and that's why, in fact, I'm not so much speaking about virtual reality, I'm going to speak about embodied experiences, about the body. 
So I like to speak about virtual reality because it's a fancy topic. Ever since I found it, or it found me, I get invited to conferences because it's fancy. But the reality is that the technology of the body is even more interesting to me than virtual reality. I look at virtual reality um, from an educational standpoint. So Doran has already introduced me. When we met um, two years ago, I was working in the field of online education. So I started out in Berlin, my career in uh, creative industries. I was working for a big production company. And uh, we were given a big amount of funding by a very big German foundation called the Robert Bosch Stiftung. And it was back in 2011, so in digital time count, that's ages ago. And they were giving us this funding um, with the aim to experiment with online education. Back then, nobody was doing that. And the aim was to find out by which means we could find um, strategies to get teenagers engaged in political issues. So we were super privileged, my team and I, we were really like doing trial and error and we created rap casting shows online and we were looking for the YouTube chancellor online and um, we did animational videos and we checked what would work and what wouldn't work. We were also accompanied by a university doing that, so there was a research um, uh, background to this whole project. And to me, the, um, the, the most important finding from that time um, is actually one that today sounds pretty banal. It's that relationship and experience matter in every sense. So in learning, context, relationship and experience matter. And for me back then, as I was working in online context, it was like, aha, okay. I thought it was about reaching uh, quantities of people, about reaching high numbers of people. But in the end, when I looked at our projects, the one that really worked out the best were the ones that involved relationship with each other, with us, with each other, with the users, with content and experience. So, um, I found this when I was preparing for the speech, and I really like this pyramid. I'm not going to go into the details, I drew it myself, so don't really focus on the uh, exactness of the levels, right? But what I like about this pyramid is that you see that the higher the level of abstraction, um, the more difficult the learning process, okay? So in the top we have the degree of abstraction which is high, and in, in the, in the, um, on the foundation we have a low level of abstraction, so it gets very concrete. And when we look at this, we see that text, pictures, audio, even motion pictures are pretty abstract to the learner. They don't involve that many senses. Maybe they just involve the eyes, they involve cognition. And the more we get down, the more senses are involved and the deeper the learning process. I think for us as educators, also as librarians, because you have a, um, an educational, uh, um, how, how would I say, uh, Auftrag? This is my love sitting here, but uh, he's failing to help me. <laughs> so you have an educational, um, um, I don't know the word, but you're there also to educate people, right? Um, so when we look at this, the interesting finding is that really we forgot about the body. So till exhibits, we are doing the job as educators and everything that comes afterwards, experience, 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 we tend to forget about it and we don't integrate it into the learning processes. Why? Because it's pretty difficult. Um, so I was super inspired by this thought and um, I took a sabbatical. I said I'm not going to work for the company anymore. I went to Chile. I um, studied with a very famous shaman and coach um, and I studied um, a personal growth, which is nothing more than learning about yourself and about the world through relationships. To me, this is the definition of personal growth. So this is what I did nine months, and the body played a major role in uh, this educational understanding of the world. So this is the framework I learned. It's called ontological coaching, and I like this graphic because it shows very well what I'm going to lay out to you in the next uh, 30 minutes. So we have three channels of learning, or three areas in which and through which we learn. First, we have the cognition, which is linked to language, this is the area we all know. This is the area we all address as educators. But then we also have the area of emotions and the area of the body, which are areas that maybe in education we tended to put to the private because we were only addressing the minds. Yeah? 
But if you look at this uh, figure, it shows that these areas are really intimately intertwined with each other. So the one cannot function without the other. And it doesn't, actually. It does not function without the other. In the small experience we just made with the smiling, you see how this works. So the body is doing a small movement, giving out a cue, which is an emotional one, then later on maybe enabling you to do something that involves your cognition. And you can find multiple examples of this in yourself, when you observe yourself. So what I want to do is tell you two um, experiences that have been made by big Ivy League universities. We always have to cite the, um, the, the important people uh, to prove that something is really so. So the first experience I want to tell you about is an experience from Yale University where actually what they did was to give an ice cold cup of water to somebody and then introduce that somebody to a stranger. And what would happen is that uh, the people who were holding the cold water would interact with the stranger with a lot more mistrust. Um, they would rate them as someone being further away from them, more distant. And then they did the same experience with giving them a hot cup of coffee and what happened was that the person would be introduced by the stranger and have a lot more trust towards this person. So isn't that amazing that just like, just the feeling, the temperature of the body can have an influence on how I react in the world later on. I think these findings are super important for us to take into consideration. The second, um, the second experience I like maybe even more, it's Amy Cuddy from Harvard University. And what she found out is that if you spend two minutes in a power position, so which can be like this, like the little boy does, or like this, this would be a power position, yeah, or uh, when you're sitting, this is a power position, okay, as opposed to an inferior position which would be like this, or also like this, or like this, so you get smaller, okay? So she found out that people in the power position, which is the Wonder Woman position, this is what she got famous for, if they spend only two minutes in this power position, actually um, on a physiological level, their levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, drops, and considerably, by 15%, I think, whereas their level of testosterone, which is the dominance, uh, dominance hormone, uh, ra raises, um, I think it was like 20%, 20 to 15%. This is amazing what the body does. And also what she found out is that these people that were spending uh, uh, two minutes, just two minutes in a power position, were more likely to um, uh, get risks, like to take risks, and they took risks more frequently. So just imagine what it means. Like if you work as a teacher, you could do this with your students two minutes in the classroom and then see what happens when they take an exam, right? So um, what I want to come to is a, um, um, a quote from Guy Claxton, who is an embodied cognition expert. I like the term of embodied cognition because it means that it doesn't mean to get rid of cognition. It just means to include cognition and transcend it by using the body, right? So he says the body, the gut, the senses, the immune system, the lymphatic system are so instantaneously and com complicatedly interacting that you can't draw a line across the neck and say, above this line, it's smart, and below the line, it's menial. And then look at our classrooms. So what do you see here? You see, it's, very, uh, it's a very ugly term, you see hats on sticks. We don't really work with the body at all. You see a teacher in a power position, she's like this. Then you see people bend, uh, pupils bending, writing. You, d you don't see any eyes meeting. You don't see any interaction, no smiles. So this is a learning environment that's not very inspiring, right? And of course, this is an old picture and things have changed, but they haven't changed that much if we are honest. So now we will have maybe these kind of situations, maybe we will even have a tool like a tablet, but still we are working a lot with our minds, all the time with our minds only. I don't want to get rid of minds, I just want to include the other uh, two areas of learning as well. So we are not smart and have bodies, we are smart because we have bodies. And for me, for me this in Chile was like an ah moment. It really meant a turn, I said wow, now I'm 
just approaching education from a completely different standpoint. After this finding, I cannot do as I did before. So um, I employed myself. I didn't go back to, a co to the company. Um, and I started to experiment with embodied experience situations. So um, I created a body-based seminar, which is called um, Eight Weeks, Eight Freedoms. It's for adults, and um, it works with the body to enhance your inner freedom. It's a classical personal growth uh, seminar. Um, then through technology, I found, uh, I found love. Uh, he's sitting there. And um, uh, what I learned from him is really how to love, I have to say. And together, um, we started experimenting with teenagers and teenage educational settings with the body. So what you see here, he's going to speak about it later on, Anselm, at 11.45, and show you a little bit um, of our project as well. But what we did was really engaging the body in learning situations. And I must say, I think it works magic. And then, of course, virtual reality headsets crossed my way. So what happened there? Um, Virtual reality found me rather than I found it. I was at a conference and I put on a headset and tried it out and it immediately sucked me and I was like, whoa, what is this? So the thing is, speaking about virtual reality doesn't really work that well because you have to try it, otherwise you won't really realize what I'm saying. I'm going to try to convey what it is about. So imagine you put on the goggles that you see here behind me and then you're not looking on a, at a screen like you're used to, but you are inside of the environment, which means that if you look around like this, yeah, or if you turn even, what you will see is a 360 degrees, 360 degrees of your environment. And the environment can be anything, from a documented reality, like someone filming actual uh, situations, so you will be on Times Square, or you will be in Syria in a refugee camp, or, or you will be uh, below a uh, thousand meters in the deep sea, okay? Um, or it can be an animated uh, environment, whatever is possible, technically can be possible in the virtual reality. So you can be diving, you can be sensing, um, as a blind person, for example, this is nodes of blindness, an experience where you are in the skin of a blind person, or you can be balancing on a tiny piece of wood on the floor, uh, 1,000 feet above the ground in uh, New York, which is the, an experience that I did, and it really freaked me out. I put on this headset, and I was standing on a wooden thing that was actually in the floor. They lay out a wooden thing. So I knew, I, there were friends of mine, I knew that I, that I was not really on this tiny piece of wood. But at the moment that I started to balance on this wood, I really, my, like my whole body reacted to this. I got sweaty hands, I was shaking, so what does virtual reality do? It really fools our bodies into believing that what we are experiencing is real. And that is revolutionary. Yeah? I think that is really revolutionary because it goes so fast. You put it on and bam, you are there. Um, I'm going to show you uh, an experience, which of course is nothing like putting on the goggles yourself, but it will give you maybe a little hint on what it could be. Uh, Florian, maybe you can um, switch off the lights. And I need sound, please. There's no picture, so what shall I do? Do you know how to help me this time? Okay, so I take the opportunity while they are fixing this to explain that there is different um, ways of uh, producing VR content. So what you're going to see here now, you're going to see people wearing the goggles and having commanders in their hands. Just hit pause. Yeah, thanks. Um, they have commands in their hands, so what they can do is really interact with their environment. So you could paint, uh, you could maybe um, uh, how do you say, shoot an arrow, yeah? There's this game where you shoot arrows. You can do things with your hands and interact. You can even interact with each other in the virtual reality. Um, and then there are VR films where you put on the goggles and you cannot really do anything with your hands, but you're a spectator in, a, in another environment. What I'm going to show you now, it's really a proper experience. So I just have to hit. Okay. 
Just look at them. Look at their faces. This might seem banal and entertaining, but look, look, at, look how they are, look at their faces, look at how they are in awe. They're admiring, they're doing things. From my point of view, when I look at this, I can really see how they are discovering something about themselves that they didn't discover before, okay? So they're really interacting and what they're doing is highly creative. It's highly creative. They are uh, inventing an own world. This is what they're doing through VR. And they're having this trance music with it, which is very um, putting you into a present moment as well. So what they are doing actually is experiencing presence. Yeah, we can stop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you go back to it. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So uh, they're experiencing presence. What is presence? To me, presence is the moment when you forget that there is something else. That would be my way of describing presence. Are there any meditators here? Do you meditate maybe? Meditators, okay, yeah. Uh, there's many other ways to achieve presence, yeah. Um, uh, but actually what VR does, it brings you instantly into presence. And this is really interesting because presence seems to be what we need in order to address complex issues of our times. Presence um, trains the opposable mind. And the opposable mind is the ability of constructively facing the tension between opposing ideas. The ability of uh, constructively facing the tension between opposing ideas. We are living in a world that is very complex with a lot of ideas which are not so easy to address with our either or logic. And what we need is an opposable mind that can find creative solutions. So VR for this could be a very interesting tool. And um, it's not a coincidence if we have meditation, mindfulness seminars in Silicon Valley, in companies, everybody's doing that now, it's a hype. Why? Because neuroscientists find out that, uh, found out that meditation really triggers your creativity and your, your, your um, opposable mind. So mystics have told us that for ages and then came scientists, they all tell us, be present, experiment, stay curious because it seems to be something very timely, something that we need, a quality that we need. Now, um, when it comes to VR research, there's already some good amount of research on VR and very interesting is the Stanford uh, Human Interaction Lab. They do incredible amounts of research and what they found out, for example, is that you can actively train empathy through VR by letting someone walk in the shoes of someone else. So you, you are put into the skin of someone else and you get more empathetic. Or that you can... Um, um, influence conservation behavior, like the use of paper or the use of water. So they did these experiences where people, after having a VR environment, where they were chopping a tree, for example, would use less paper than people who had read a text about chopping wood. Um, and they do many of these things. If you're interested in this, just check out the website because it's really, I, I find it very passionate in what they're, what they're doing. And then there is other high rank organizations like for example, the United Nations that started their own um, VR series and they use it to influence people with um, power and money. So they're not even screening these VR experiences that much online, but they're using it in their, um, in their high rank meetings. They put on and then people will have a better understanding of the realities of the people. So I'm going to show you a, a second experience. I hope it will work now. Do you have to come back maybe? I don't know. And this experience you will see is one um, where it's more about a documented reality that was filmed beforehand. And so you put on the goggles and you will be inside the world of a little girl living in a Syrian refugee camp. Um, I suppose this VR experience that I'm going to show you now is one of the best known experiences um, that exists right now. It's called uh, Clouds Over Cedra. And what you can do, I cannot show you now, but imagine just you had the goggles on and you could turn around and see everything. We had to download the film before and so I cannot even show you how that would look. If you look it up online, you will have a hand where you can look around on the video screen. Yeah? Right now you can only see this. So is there a sound? 
I think it starts now. My name is Deidre. I am 12 years old. I am in the fifth grade. I am from Syria in the Dar'a province in Khil City. I have lived here in the Zaatari camp in Jordan for the last year and a half. I have a big family, three brothers. One is a baby. He cries a lot. I asked my father if I cried when I was a baby, and he says, I did not. I think I was a stronger baby than my brother. Okay, so I'm just going to cut off the volume. Um, so what happens here is that right now, of course, it just gives you a glimpse of what it would be if you put on goggles. It would be completely different because now, right now she's like stretched. You see this 360 degrees angle. It's, it's not really that. You put that on and she's sitting right here, okay? You have to imagine she's sitting, sitting right here and she's telling her, uh, you, her story. And, um, and it's very touching, really. So um, many times I have tried out VR experiences, I found myself crying in the end because it can be very, very intimate and very um, close. And I think what VR films mainly do is that they offer us other narratives. This is very interesting. Me coming from the field of creative industries, I'm very adept to the concept of narrative. And even if you look into political sciences and into how societies change and what they need for a change, you see that it's not so much uh, determined that they need, so the things that will happen and everything is going to go wrong, but what they need is narratives. So I think what VR can do is really let us experience different narratives without taking a big amount of risk because it's just a virtual environment. So we can step into that virtual environment, experience it for ourselves and step out again. And then we have another way of judgment. I think this is really, really, um, really, really interesting when it comes to VR. Ah, so we have to, yeah, we have to stop the movie again. Um, yeah, so the power of narratives. Of course, um, maybe you are already thinking about it, why I'm, I'm talking about it. Of course, there's a big downside to this. So it's a technology that is uh, coming. I think um, it's not so much a matter of if it is coming, but rather a matter of when is it coming. It is coming. This is why I'm speaking to you about it, because I think we should get started to know what it is. Some people speak about VR as the next big digital revolution, something like the internet, that it's really going to affect our lives and change the way we work, maybe even the way we learn. And um, from my point of view, I work a lot. I also work with libraries in, Germany's, uh, in Germany. I work with teachers and so on. I think that very often educators are the last in the row to, uh, to know what is technologically possible. Um, and I think that we should start seeing the options, yeah? And um, we're going to speak about the dangers in a second, but I deliberately chose to tell you first about the potentials, because when it comes to technology, especially in these old fields, old fields of labor, um, like libraries, like teaching, very often I see this. It's like, no. Yeah, people are very septic about technology, and then it's also a generational thing. So I, I chose to first lay out the potential um, before showing you the dangers. And the potential for me is that in the society that we live in today, uh, virtual reality could be a way of um, bringing us into another understanding. Why? Because we're living in a society that is facing fear, or that is moved by fear. Yeah? We have uh, climate change, we have crazy politicians in, in very important uh, positions. Um, we have a lot of racism. Um, we have so many challenges that we don't really know how to face. And a lot of societies are really moved or not moved by fear. So what I think VR can do is convey courage. As I said before, showing us other ways possible by bringing us back into our bodies, out of our minds, by bringing us into the present moment. And I think this is a super interesting tool, as well for libraries, maybe. Maybe for libraries it is even a, a super interesting tool to bring people into the libraries. It can be a new medium. Um, it's not that expensive. And um, yeah, I think that, uh, that we should start at least exploring it. Um, when we think of the 
of the little drawing I showed you in the beginning from my ontological coaching framework, what VR really does is enable learning at the core. Yeah? So um, not, not all of VR, but a good VR experience could do that. It could integrate cognition, emotions, and the body in a way that we really, in the center, connect to something that I would call our souls. So now everybody can have a different understanding of what a soul can be. I think a soul is something that you cannot grasp with words, so I'm not even going to try. But a soul for me is the ah oh, moment. Ah, I understood something. I don't even know how I did, but I understood something. I uh, entitled my, my talk, the Discover the Co Soul of Science, Discover the Soul of Science, um, because I think that everything we need, we already have. So we have super good scientific research that we can base ourselves on. Um, we have narratives to tell. We have a technology that is developing in a fast pace. So all we have to do is find other ways of narrating all this. And this is what VR can do. It is a very good tool for discovery, for discovery, yeah? Taking away the color from things. Because things are there and they are very beautiful. We just have to take away the cover. Okay. I already said VR is coming and we don't know how it is coming. I don't know how it is coming. I don't have a clue. What I did in Germany, I united some educators and we were speaking about the potentials and the dangers of VR. So we're kind of exploring the question, but we don't really know. And there are some potential dangers to it. The most important question being, who is going to control the switch? Who is owning the technology? As always, this is a very important question. Who is owning this technology? Facebook is already owning Oculus, which is one of the biggest VR uh, production companies. Um, Google is highly invested in the matter. Then, of course, we have governments. We have the marketeers, marketing companies. We have porn. We have all sorts of people very interested in the use of VR. And I think also this is a responsibility to us as educators, as librarians, as people of reason, as scientists, as researchers, to um, engage in this dialogue about what is good VR content, how are we going to ensure that VR is not used for the wrong purposes, how are we going to ensure that VR is properly accompanied if we work in educational settings, is it really okay to put on goggles and then bam, and then you take them off and Nobody works with you after that. So I think there are a lot of questions that we can discuss as educators on how we want this VR revolution, if it's coming, how we want this to happen. So I think it's really important uh, on conferences like this one that we speak about these topics. This is why I brought it to you. Um, then the good news is we don't have to wait for VR goggles to arrive in our hands. We can also say, OK, I don't have a VR goggle for now. I can start experiencing with the body. Because everything I told you doesn't have that much to do with VR only, it has to do with embodied experiences. So just imagine in your settings, whichever setting that may be, you would start to explore the body in your way, in the way that suits you as the educator in that sense, you would start to use the body with your students. And just see what happens. Just approach it with the scientific mind of trial and error. Just see what happens. I can promise you, there's a lot of things that are going to happen. Ever since I used the body in my things, everything I do, stuff happens. Why? Because I give out control of my brain and I give it to the body. So what I would like to do um, for a closing session is to end this talk with silence. So I invite you to, if you want to, to shut down your, your visual sense, close your eyes, See what that does to you if you want to do that. Just shut down your visual sense. And it's pretty stunning what can happen when, once you shut down your visual sense. I'm going to stop talking in a minute. I want you to feel the togetherness in the room, the company of the other people next to you, and just see what it does. And if you can feel something else when you close your eyes, then you can when you have them open and look at me while I'm talking and presenting.
you let go of the wish to hold reality and instead you let reality hold you, you are always in an appropriate place. Thank you. That was an interesting closure for a session. <laughs> so, um, who wants to start to that question? Hey. Um, Hi. Excellent presentation, really. Um, and I think I loved it, especially because even though we've been through some of kind of the same experiences, I mean, not the shaman thing, but definitely the VR, uh, my conclusions were almost on the opposite side. Because mm -hmm. um, you started by talking about embodied experiences, and I think there's a general agreement that we are embodied spirits, as that's the term in philosophy mainly for this one. However, experiencing VR, it's kind of the, brings you the argument that we are exactly not that. I mean, the, the, the traditional distinction between mind and body mm -hmm. is at play, surprisingly, in VR. Because what happens, what is very weird when you fly over New York, as I also did myself, is after a few seconds of being confused, where is my body, where are my legs, how am I standing up here, what's going on, I'm gonna die, or I'm gonna fall, after a few seconds, which is very little in terms of, of the mind, you get accustomed to actually not having a body, mm -hmm. of being merely a dot somewhere in a space that you can't even figure out what that is, and flying very bodiless through a, something that is probably just an illusion of your mind. So, But at the same time, I think while you're flying, you're going to experience something in your body. Sure, it's, in it's your actual body, even if in the, yeah, yeah, in the virtual sure. reality you don't have a body because you're flying, you don't see sure, yourself, yeah. you're going to feel something in your body. It's going to be like, woo, I'm flying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but, but that, that feeling is still in your mind. So, that, that's, so this would be mm -hmm. my, 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 my problem, let's say, would be with the word, because um, you had a chart that said, uh, the one that you discovered the soul in the, in the middle. So it was, it, mm -hmm. uh, what was it, the first uh, uh, circle? Yes, yes, you mean this one. I'm going to because switch to it. Yeah, because there is a, yeah, let's go to this yeah, one. Yeah, this one, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you, you make a distinction here between cognition and emotions, which is a valid distinction, but they are traditionally conceived together as being a mind. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, I don't think it's, nobody here would, 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 would argue that these need to be separated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem, as, as you described about kids staying in, and being just minds, is actually not just they're just minds, it's because they're just cognition in, in your term here. Mm -hmm. So the problem indeed would be how to get their minds to be a connection of emotion and cognitions, because this is what we humans are. But I, I would argue that we're definitely not bodies, or if, if we're talking about bodies, they're just one of the vessels in which we can put our minds. Mm -hmm. And the VR is, an, is a fabulous example that we can basically move our mind to a different vessel, which is a VR space, a virtual reality, and we can live there just as fine. Yeah. Uh, and that's, for me, it was uh, an immense shock. I, I, I had to think about it for, for weeks after that. What does that mean for us? Because I, was, I always thought uh, that we are kind of a, uh, this whole, this, this togetherness of mind and body, but apparently we are not. I mean, Descartes was right, and the whole 19th century and 20th century philosophy was wrong, uh, in a way, in a way, mm -hmm. of course. Interesting. And, and Did you try it out yourself? Yeah, I, I suppose. Yes, yes, Otherwise, course, yeah, you yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. And it's, it's not only that. There is a, a second uh, experience, and I'll, I'll stop after this. Uh, I was in a, in a hospital, whatever, so I had a, a, a trouble with my hand, mm -hmm. and I was looking at my hand, uh, and I it was a way in which it was pain and something, it's something with an allergy, right? And I was looking at my hand, and I, I had a distinct feeling that I am something that is looking at my hand. So I, I thought of my body at a, in that moment as a property, in a way. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of feeling sorry for my hands, so not for myself, but for yeah, my hand, something yeah. was happening to it. So these kind of experiences, I think they are telling that there is an actual difference, this distance between mind and body, and we, we are just about, in a way, to overcome that by mm -hmm. being able to move our minds into different spaces. And VR is a fabulous example of that. Yeah. That would be my... Yeah, thank you. Very interesting contribution. I think, actually, that um, what may happen when we look more into VR environments, uh, that we have to rethink our notion or our concept of the body. 
because I wouldn't agree that our body is not in the experience. It's just not our body. And of course you're right, afterwards it's the mind acting, but how do we get out of our brains by our bodies? So if you look at any mystical tradition and also at VR, what they all do is always using the body, as you say, as a vessel. If it's just sitting down and meditating and not moving, I'm not really doing anything with my body, but I use my body as a vessel to get out of my brain. And I think that VR does that in a kind of tweaked sense, because of course it takes away our, our real bodies, but it gives us a new one, which isn't there, which is virtual, but which has a response to what we are feeling. You see what I mean? And there's a lot of very interesting, very nerdy VR research on how how we can apply the body in experiences. For example, I watched a talk, a woman that is really researching body motions. So she says that she's working on a project called Luna Project and it's, it's about uh, taking, it's like a, about taking something from, uh, from the universe. So it's about walking around and picking grapes like, and she wants it to be in a very light way. Yeah, she wants it to be like this. So her research is really, how can I do this? So it's not going to be like this, that I don't have the power grip, but that I have a precision grip where I can move like this. So this is, the body is in VR research, it's a super important topic. They speak about the body a lot. How can we do this so that what it does to the mind will be this? And this is what I find interesting. So yeah, thank you for, the, for your remark. Do you find yourself in what I'm saying? I think we agree, actually, yeah, yeah. Anybody else has a question? I am curious about one thing. Yes, Doris. The discovery thing. What's the age where you should give the kids the opportunity to discover like this so they can still grow up and make a clear difference and actually learn everything that you said without getting addicted and without wanting to stay in a world that is virtual? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a good topic. I think there is not so much research on VR for kids, like the small ones uh, yet. So I cannot really respond to your question in terms of number age. I don't know. Um, but from my point of view, it's just like with technology in general. I think what we need to do always is, um, no matter the age, is to teach ourselves first maybe and then others. Um, how to use technology for the better, and when to know when to stop. And I think for this, again, you will need presence and an opposable mind which tells you. So, you know, I think it, it, what, what we need is to train ourselves better in knowing what, what is good for us. So we will not fi f uh, fall into this trap of getting addicted, because yes, there's a lot of addictive potential in this, and, uh, and it might keep us from living the life we have to live in the real world. Yeah. Does this respond to your question yeah, yeah. a little bit? Yeah. yeah, it does, it does. Thank you. One last question, if there is anybody. Well, if not, Anna, thank you very much. Thank you so very, much. Very Thank you.